This is the one with a Swiss army flashlight, a literal spacewalk, the worst defense mechanisms ever, a hot young Vulcan, oh, and Cybermen. It's called The Wheel in Space. Here we go. We're embarking on a voyage all through time and all through space. Counting Daleks, Dal and Oot, and the Cybertronic race. Some Tarans look like taters, and Silurians all have wonky scales. And the Doctor has a TARDIS, we're reviewing all his tales. Who back when? Reviewing all of who there is. Who back when? Subscribe and rate on iTunes, please. Episode by episode, we're trudging down this temporal road. Come join us on this odyssey. What other choice could there be than who back when? Who back when? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode C043 of Who Back When, a Doctor Who podcast. I am Pumpkin. Yes, I am. And uh, once again, I'm doing a solo mission for those of you who have just joined this podcast. Um, welcome aboard. Also, here's the here's the shtick. Lots and lots of... Oh, God, I am getting really tired of saying this every single time I do a solo mission. But here we go. Uh, lots of um, serials of classic who were lost. You probably already know this. And because the only way of really, quote-unquote, viewing them is by going through the, the recons, most of them made by Loose Cannon Productions, uh, I'm sort of doing those reviews as solo missions. Uh, normally, I sit down with one or two of my co-hosts and we debate and uh, rate and review a, a serial together or an episode together. In this case, well, you're stuck with me. It's going to be a soliloquy rather than a dialogue. That's fine, though. I think it's going to be pretty good. Most people who tune into these solos, uh, and by the way, thank you very much for all the feedback, guys. Um, most people who tune into these solos do so because they also <laughs> think it's a bit of a slog to go through the, so uh, the, the missing episodes, and this sort of provides them with a synopsis of sorts. Synopsis slash analysis, let's call it that. Anyway, that's the whole deal. That's why I'm on my own. Uh, today, I'm going to be looking at The Wheel in Space. It is a six-part serial, two episodes of which are still intact, episodes three and six, four of which are completely missing. But the, the recons, made by Luz Cannon, I think, are absolutely fantastic. They've supplemented some of the, the missing scenes with 3D animations that look really, really cool. Uh, and in fact, at first, I thought that those were recovered scenes, but no, it turns out they're 3D animations. They're very, very cool. You can find all of those episodes uh, lost and intact on dailymotion.com. Just give it a quick search. The Wheel in Space was written by David Whittaker. David Whittaker, obviously a dude we've encountered on Who Back When before. He wrote such masterpieces as The Edge of Destruction, aka The Edge of Discretion, The Rescue, <laughs> which is totally a pants, The Crusade, Amazing, Power of the Daleks, Evil of the Daleks, Enemy of the World, this one, The Wheel in Space, and he's going to return one more time with one more serial, namely The Ambassadors of Death, which is also a title of a Doctor Who serial that rings, a, well, basically like a, a legendary one to me. I'm not sure I've ever seen it, but I'm pretty sure it's considered one of the legendary ones. The Wheel in Space also uh, has those connotations for me. Uh, the Wheel in Space was written by David Whittaker, but the story came from one... Kit Peddler, obviously Kit Peddler, the, the inventor, the creator of the Cybermen. So, surprise, surprise, this is a Cyberman serial as well. Uh, and, yeah, anyway, that's about it, really. Let's jump into a bite-sized chunk of who. Bite-sized chunk of who. Doc and Jamie materialize aboard a space rocket with a humbly homicidal robot who's uh, never explained, and no crew, just drifting through space. The TARDIS is broken, but before long they're picked up by nearby space station, the wheel, and shit starts to go down. Turns out the rocket wasn't empty, there were Cybermen aboard it as well, and soon they've taken over the space station too, hypnotizing and or killing its obviously human crew, and literally, not figuratively, literally, incinerating their corpses. This serial is amazing. <laughs> B-Scout over, you are welcome. Okay, I'm gonna jump straight into this one. I'm gonna see if I can keep this one under an hour. We will see. Episode 1. Before we get into space, uh, we start at the end of the last episode. Uh, in case you haven't seen it or listened to my solo review thereof, by the way, uh, do one or both. The serial in question is called Fury from the Deep, and it's not half bad. <laughs> At the end of that one, now former companion Victoria Waterfield left the show because she was a boring snob. And even though we had a gratuitous amount of goodbyes for her then, we have to start with another, not one, but two goodbyes slash will miss her scenes now. Good riddance, if you ask me. Whatever. They land somewhere, though. The TARDIS, that is. Um, piloted by the Doctor and Jamie. They don't know where yet. There's only static on the scanner. Look at the fold indicator, will you? It's round there on the left. And then we get the first instance of the worst defense measures ever that I had mentioned in the intro, as the TARDIS shows them, quote-unquote, 
Temptations. It's basically a series of really pleasant looking vistas on the scanner. I can't remember what they were now, but they were like a lake and a beautiful forest, uh, then a hot tub on the planet Risa, I don't know, Playboy Mansion, something along those lines. But what the shit? Like, this is not the best way to warn them to go elsewhere. Jamie's first reaction is even, that looks great. Like, let's leave the TARDIS pronto so I can dip my quill. And it's only after a while that, that the Doctor explains that the whole Temptations concept. The TARDIS is apparently, to explain this, the TARDIS is apparently showing them better places places, so they'll go there instead. But why not just show them a stop sign or some, some footage of Jamie's grandmother masturbating? That'll keep them in the TARDIS. No time to contemplate that image any further. The TARDIS fluid link is gone, and they're leaking mercury like it's going out of style, which I think is the same thing that happened in, was it the Daleks? I think so. The Daleks and also in Marco Polo, both of them William Hartnell serials. I think so. Either way, the TARDIS is filling up with poisonous gas, and they're forced to leave regardless. Before they do so, Doc removes the, and this will come into play a lot in this serial, the Time Vector Generator. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Maybe that prevented the gas from... I have, I have no idea. Whatever. He, he removes it. Um, it doesn't appear to be broken, uh, but we learn that it's what apparently is what alters the spatial dynam dimensions of the TARDIS. So, so now the inside of the TARDIS is the same size as a police box. But then why is it called a time vector <laughs> generator? Uh, and also, was it called the same thing in the Time Meddler, where he, well, William Hartnell it was, uh, sabotaged said gizmo inside the meddling monk's TARDIS so that it changed in size? I don't think it was called that. I can't remember. One of you fine people of podcast land will know the answer. Uh, pop a comment on whobackwhen.com. Uh, oh, tangent. Check it. Twitter is great. And uh, <laughs> please keep all of your comments coming. But if you comment on Eps on Twitter, they may get lost in the ether as time goes by. However, if you pop the episode post URL in the tweet in question, then whobackwhen.com should theoretically pick it up. And not only will your tweet remain, but your comment should show up on the site as well, immortalized in the annals of whobackwhen.com. So just bear that in mind. Okay, anyway, tangent over. Back to the show. Doc acknowledges that there must be artificial gravity because they're not floating around, but then immediately says they must be on the ground because there's no movement. Sloppy doctor. Also, he offers Jamie a lemon sherbet. Not important per se, but I reckon they're the same ones he got from the Celestial Toy Maker, so that's kind of fun. Also, the Celestial Toy Maker, don't watch it, but please do listen to the Who Back When review of it. It's pretty funny, though I say so myself. So Doc and Jamie wander around, they find the living quarters, and ascertain that the rocket is all empty. And then we get what I wait, what I presumed at the time was actual survived footage of a wonderful looking robot. Turns out this is a 3D animation, by the way. Um, <laughs> this creature is, or this creation, is amazing. He's like Marvin the Paranoid Android's chubby cousin, Darwin. Like, he's just looking around. He's looking <laughs> not particularly menacing, but I, I really like him. He's, he's like a chumbly, but with legs. All right. So they're not alone. Dum-dum-dum is what I'm trying to say. We learn that the spaceship should carry a crew of four, two on duty and two resting, but there's no one around, and they're just, quote, floating aimlessly in space. Let's bear that in mind. Uh, either way, so not on the ground, then. Well, all right. Stick your rod diamond. Time. time vector generator. I stick it back in and we'll float off somewhere else. <laughs> Jamie's hungry, so Doc operates this machine that's basically a Star Trek replicator that only produces square food. Jamie orders something appropriately bland and narrow-minded, but so does the Doc. I mean, <laughs> what is the Doc who's traveled throughout the universe? Uh, why would he... Like, why would he choose pork and potatoes? That's what he chooses, actually. Uh, makes no sense. He should at least be asking for future pork with space potatoes. What else? We get another possibly intact, possibly recreated scene. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I watched this one on my phone. Of Darwin walking down a corridor. Very creepy music in the background. Very, very cool. Actually, come to think of it, he looks more like... I'm being a little sexist and assuming that Darwin's a dude. Uh, he looks more like the robot from Lost in Space went on a diet. Yeah. Or possibly like those square box robots from Star Wars, except with hands. Anyway, put all of those ideas in your head together and see what comes out. Blah, 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 blah. Darwin finds the TARDIS and seals it in by, like, gluing the doors to it shut. Let's put a pin in that. <laughs> Darwin interfaces with a computer now, and the spaceship shakes about. Doc's getting desperate. He doesn't give a shit about uh, the poisonous mercury vapor and just wants to leave. We've got to get back to the TARDIS. It's the only safe place. Don't the mercury stuff. Never mind that. Well, yeah. And then Darwin dispatches these six glowing metal orbs, not entirely sure where to, that float and fly down a corridor. We get to see out the window where they're heading now. 
and it is the space station we saw during the opening title sequence, the titular wheel in space. Did I mention this, by the way? The opening credits are slightly different to the normal shtick. Uh, towards the end of the background, behind the time vortex waves, or whatever you want to call them, they sort of fade, uh, or it sort of fades, to the image of the wheel. It's very nice. I came. <laughs> uh, blam! Doc is doing some of his worst acting on Doctor Who to date. Oh no, oh how awful, oh goodness me, that sort of thing. But I'm not buying it, Doc. No problems, though. He's fabulous throughout the rest of the serial, so all is forgiven. Then he uses the time vector nonsense generator in his pocket as a blowtorch to open the door, uh, because apparently it doubles as that as well. Oh, sorry, I'm speeding through this one. What's the next bullet points? Right. So then they come upon this locked door uh, aboard the ship, and the Doctor uses his time vector nonsense generator in his pocket as a blowtorch to open it, because apparently it doubles as that. And this is the first instance of what I meant with it being a Swiss army knife of sorts. Shazam! Darwin's behind him and makes him, and us, jump in terror. But Jamie saves the day by throwing a blanket on the robot, like he's a puny 1970s Dalek, and they hide back in the crew quarters again. And as Darwin, now freed from the shackles of blanketdom, attempts to lightsaber through the door, they use the nonsense generator as a laser weapon that blasts through the door and blows up Darwin. Because apparently it does that too. Second instance. Is there anything the nonsense generator can't do? Uh, but also, question. Couldn't Darwin just have opened the door? Surely, since he, we even saw him interface with a computer before, he must be able to control these things. Why wouldn't he be able to unlock it? Anyway, ugh, first anyway of the episode. Darwin's totes malodes dead as shit. And let's just take a moment to contemplate Darwinism, shall we? That robot is never explained. You already know that this is a Cyberman serial, right? But was he a Cyberman? No. Was he a man-made robot reprogrammed by the Cybermen? Did his firmware just suddenly go bonkers? We never find out. He's now dead. Like, let me rephrase that. The main villain of a whole week's worth of Doctor Who just got killed, and we never find out where he came from or what his goddamn agenda was. Did the Cybers even know about him? Is there more than one? Do you know why I asked that? Because we're never told, that's why. Plot-wise, I am already blue-balled over here, and I imagine that throughout the rest of the serial, people sitting at home watching this, you know, quote-unquote, live, they would have they would have been expecting Darwin or something along those lines to show up again, but it doesn't. Ugh. Cut to the wheel. Surprise, surprise, English people are running the show, but much like in the previous Cyberman serials, uh, the Tenth Planet and the Moon Base are the ones that I'm thinking of. Both of which are awesome, by the way, and you really must listen to our reviews, too. Uh, I reviewed them, both of them, actually, with um, one of my co-hosts, Nick Laley. Good stuff. Tangent. Back to the show. Again. <laughs> I really need to stop digressing. We learn that the ship is called the Silver Carrier, which is pretty awesome, because at least in New Who, there are so many references to Cybermen as silver this or that. That may happen later on in Classic Who as well, I don't know, but this is definitely the very first time that it happens. Very cool. I like it. Anyway, the humans aboard the wheel radio to them, and when they don't get a response, they tell them to, <laughs> I paraphrase, press the red thingy to operate the emergency radio. But what the shit? The nerve. How dare they presume that they know more about how to operate the silver carrier than his goddamn crew whom they must assume that they're speaking with. Okay, so now the balls are floating through space and apparently into the wheel. I say into the wheel, I'm not sure. I think at least some of them do, but not all of them, for reasons that I shall reveal in, I think, the next episode. Also, the wheel has this X-ray laser trained at the ship, ready to blow it out of space because the head honcho over there, a chap named Jarvis, is a total dick. Massive cliffhanger alert. Will Doctor and Jamie be blown to smithereens? You'll have to tune in next week to find out. End of episode one, episode two. What's her face? Gemma. You don't know Gemma yet. She's the doctor aboard the wheel. Let's call her Bones. Uh, she allegedly psychoanalyzes Jarvis. No need to give him a more fun name. And basically says that he's overcompensating for having a small wang by ordering the rocket to be destroyed. And let's put a pin in the psychology elements of that and continuously refer back to it. Doc is totally out now with a concussion, and he will be for most of the ep, so I'm assuming the few scenes in which he appears in this one, in which he basically just complains and wails, were shot last week and Troughton's in the Maldives again. Jamie uses the nonsense generator as a flashlight now, <laughs> aiming it through the window to signal the wheel, which is pretty clever, but, you know, why doesn't it blow up? goddamn hole in the rocket's hull. <laughs> That's a Swiss army generator, number two, by the way. Number two? Number three, I think. What it does do, though, is uh, create lots of noise over the comms, like interference, which leads the wheel team to believe there are survivors aboard the silver carrier. The static is massively debilitating, though. Like, one of the dudes, Rodkin, I think his name is, is severely injured by the noise. So, 
well done, Jamie. <laughs> uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and so on. We get some possibly real footage of two astronauts floating toward the rocket. They're wearing the same outfits as the, in the Tenth Planet, by the way, i.e. the outfits that would later be recycled in Star Wars. Uh, is it Empire? I think Empire Strikes Back. Where it was worn by, what's his face, the reptilian bounty hunter who looks a lot like a Gorn. Anyway, check out whobackwhen.com for comparison shots. Uh, the astronauts take Doc and Jamie aboard the wheel. A not having noticed the blown-up robots, Darwin, and B, without us getting any explanation as to how they ferried DJ through space unharmed. <laughs> I mean, Doc, for one, is unconscious, so <laughs> whatever. Bullet point time. Blam! Tanya Lernov, this faux Russian babe whose role on the wheel is unspecified, is worried about air pressure drops and strange magnetic readings. Could this be from the silver balls, I wonder? Hmm. Uh, and she's talking to some dude who looks like a blonde David Hasselhoff named, I want to say Leo, but it may have been Ryan. Or both. I can't remember. I keep mixing up the male characters. Kapow! Bones examines Jamie now and asks him his name, at which point he reads... John Smith and Associates off some machine on her desk, like he's Kaiser fucking Soze. Can you give me your full name, please? Uh, James Robert McCrimmon. Uh, Jamie. Thank you. And your friend? Uh, the doctor. I can't put that down. Uh, John Smith. She doesn't believe him, and as you do with potential saboteurs whom you distrust, you know, she offers him a tour of the facilities. <laughs> Another case of awful defences, you might say. And on top of that, Jamie is to be shown the parapsychology library. So another goddamn hint at the writer possibly not knowing anything about psychology and just throwing terms around. Why do they have a parapsychology library aboard the ship anyway? Are they studying ESP? Ugh. He's to be toured around by Zoe, the librarian, and, spoilers, future companion of Patrick Troughton's, and a worthy replacement of Victoria Waterfield's, I would say. She's to secretly observe him, though, Bones tells tells her as Zoe ducks out of their Skype call to finish up an RNA analysis. Well, that's parapsychology for you. Uh, tangent alert, this may just be the recon, but it looks like they used that Star Trek TNG title font for the library sign. Anyway, tangent over. And then as Jamie enters, Zoe is recording something about astronomy, which also has little to do with parapsychology, one might say. But he registers her as hot enough, and honest to God, I kid you not, he threatens to spank her. Just you watch your lip or I'll put you across my knee and lad at you. <laughs> This is going to be fun. And her response is just... Do you know anything about interstellar flora? Eh, uh, no. Why do you? I thought you studied parapsychology. And on top of that, moments later, Jamie meets Duggan, the chap who wins the most in-your-face fake American accent of the week award, and who tells them he's a botanist, or whatever, and that Bones told him... Doc Corwin said it was good psychology or something. Jesus. It will never stop. We also get a rundown of the wheel's defense systems. Laser cannon, force field, et al., and Zoe, let's call her Zoe, asks... What's his speciality? Sir, uh, what? Well, is he physicist, biochemist, astronomer, biometrician? Parapsychologist. Sorry, I'm going into loads of detail and quoting half of the episode here, but we go from here to one of my favorite cuts of the episode. Duggan asks Jamie when the doc will be up and about again. Cut to Bones answering the same question to, what's his face, other fake American, Jarvis. Uh, I love it. That feels very modern in a way. I can't think of that having occurred in Classic Who before, but it's certainly something we're accustomed to seeing in, in modern films and TV. Right? I think so. Kapow! Bones suggests Jamie and Doc might be stowaway saboteurs with no space training, who killed the original crew of the Silver What's It? Surfer. <laughs> it's a good thing she let him go. Uh, and the reason she thinks this is because Jamie asked for a glass of water earlier, but then ignored it, as in he didn't drink it. Which, you know, fair enough. Uh, water is a hot commodity, so to speak, in space. But then again, there was a fucking replicator on the ship, so actually, I take that back. <laughs> and it seems she hasn't entertained the idea that he may have received tremendous space training and that he's actually just being a dick. Whatever. The scene goes on. Mainly it's a radio-visual relay station for Earth, a halfway house for deep spaceships, a space research station, stellar early warning station for all types of space phenomena. And parapsychology library. Another soundbite as Jamie tries to sit in the controller's chair. Not there. That's the controller's chair. Pardon me. He likes that scene. <laughs> Star Trek jokes. And then off to the cliffhanger, and it's a two-parter. Number one, they're going to blow up the rocket with the TARDIS on board, and Jamie disappears off screen, no doubt to sabotage it. Number two, the balls are in the power room of the wheel now, and one of them has grown, I think, in the wheel? Power room of the wheel? Actually, I say that. I think... Possibly. <laughs> no. I'm going to take that back entirely. Uh, we see a bunch of balls, uh -huh, uh -huh, and I think these are aboard the rocket. I'm Actually, yeah, I'm going to say I know these are aboard the rocket, not the wheel. One of them has grown, though, and we get to see that it's not just a ball, it's an egg. 
and it's glowing. And what's inside it? Aha! Uh-huh. Inside it is a Cyberman, who, I suppose, has now gestated to full size and punches out of the egg like he's a goddamn velociraptor. End of episode two, episode three. And guess what? This episode is actually available to watch in full. And it's so good, really. <laughs> Do yourselves a favor. And if you don't want to watch the whole serial, and I get that a lot of you don't, then just take 20 minutes and watch this episode to get a feel for it. Or take 40 minutes and watch this one and, and episode 6, which is also fully intact. Very, very good ones. Highly recommended. Anyway, let's get on with it. Jamie finds some quick set plastic in a spray can and sabotages the laser by, well, spraying plastic on it. But why not just tell them about the TARDIS? Or lie about the TARDIS and say that there's, like, important scientific work or something aboard the ship? Or maybe actually crew members that their, you know, resources haven't registered on their screen. Uh, and that the ship, for that reason, needs to be kept safe. And by the way, why is he happy to have the TARDIS remain aboard a spaceship that, you know, even if they don't blast it out of the sky, is just bobbing around space, unmanned? For all he knows, and the dock for that matter, the rocket could just float away forever, and the TARDIS along with it. Anyhow, he's caught red-handed, so now people are obviously suspecting him of being a terrorist, but he still won't tell them why he did it. Cut back to the rocket, where there are now Two Cybermen talking to a so-called Cyber Planner on Skype, confirming that all phases are ready. Shit is clearly about to go down, but let's just take a moment to discuss what's going on. First of all, the two new Cybers, I presume, were not aboard the ship before, but in fact were hatched out of, you know, these silver balls. Uh, And maybe when Darwin released the balls into space, a couple of them just stayed aboard the Silver Surfer, or maybe they returned to it. Who knows? Either way, if they'd been on the ship before, then surely we would have heard about it, right? Or at least Doc and Jamie would have. But why leave a fat robot around to plant a couple of cyber eggs on a spaceship that's already in your custody? And we'll get to that a little later. If you could just much more easily have a couple of fully gestated cybers on board. Makes no sense to me. So, we're back in the laser room again, and now everyone leaves it, except for, I think, Duggan. And then suddenly a Cybermat enters, and he's like, oh, how lovely. And then he actually hides it before some other engineers come back in to help him repair the laser. But why? Why would you do that? There are, these are the shittest astronauts ever. The engineers leave again, and Duggan now notices that the Cybermat has destroyed all of the <clears throat> Bernalium, which is the thing the laser is powered by. So now, even if they repair the thing, they'll still be sitting ducks. But guess what? He still hides and covers for the Cybermat, thinking it's just some harmless robotic space insect. <laughs> like, yeah, you must be harmless. Idiots. Anyway, meanwhile, Doc's awoken with partial amnesia, and meteors are heading straight for the wheel, and more Cybermats are popping up all over the laser room. And that really annoys me, by the way. The Cybermats on the wheel must come from other eggs, right? So why wouldn't Darwin just have sent across some Cyberman eggs instead? Skip all of these initial steps. God damn it, like, just send them a Cyberman, end the serial in two episodes. Done. All right, we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah, we'll get. Bones now checks on Doc with the John Smith contraption and a stethoscope and doesn't register two hearts or anything alien about him whatsoever. So the conclusion is that either the contraption is on the fritz or Bones is an utter shite doctor. And by the way, I... I feel like I don't really have to mention this, because surely everyone who tunes into a Doctor Who podcast will be aware of this, but the fact that this contraption is called the John Smith contraption, and the fact that it then inspires Jamie to refer to the Doctor as John Smith, pretty awesome, right? Even though, I I mean, this isn't the first time that he has used that alias. He was, uh, ooh, the Faceless Ones, I think. He called himself John Smith. Uh, possibly Evil of the Daleks? No. Uh, I can't remember now. Uh, either way, yes, wait, no, sorry, someone else referred to him as John Smith in Evil of the Daleks, that's what it was. Uh, but, yeah, still pretty cool, as that is one of his recurring, or will be one of his recurring uh, alibis. Alibis? Aliases, is what I'm trying to say. Right, Kablamo. We're introduced to Zoe, a young astrophysicist and pure maths major, uh, and parapsychological <laughs> librarian, like, who is basically a Vulcan. And I'm not 100% sure what her deal is. She mentions throughout this serial that she was trained to only consider facts, created, quote-unquote, by a doctrine of pure logic. And people do complain that she's like a robot. Bones also says at one point that, fortunately, the conditioning or brainwashing or whatever of, you know, Zoe's alma mater didn't really take, so she has a surprising amount of personality, in brackets, for a fucking robot, end brackets. And hopefully we'll learn more about her origins in the following serials. But I will say, right off the bat, I like her. I'm really, really pleased that we have a companion with some agency and, you know, an IQ greater than her shoe size. After having to stumble across time and space with Victoria Waterfield, I am relieved to have Zoe on board. Anyway, 
uh, has always reached the, uh, the conclusion that the Silver Surfer must have been refueled at some point in order to make it this far, which, A, means I'm vindicated for my forget about eggs and just keep cybers on board plot rewrite suggestion, and B, is a great scene because Zoe and Doc are sort of butting heads about logic here. You can't disprove the fact. It's pure logic. Logic, my dear Zoe merely enables one to be wrong with authority. And it's really great. You can see their chemistry forming on screen. My next note here is Cyberman exposition. So, the Cybers, the Cybers, much like Daleks, obviously need to provide exposition. Even though they're cybernetic, you know, cybernetically linked to each other or whatever, and wouldn't need to say these things out loud because surely everyone's already on board. <laughs> no matter. Here's their plan in brief. The Cybermats are going to destroy the Benalium, Check. And then the wheel will find Benalium on board the Silver Surfer. Okay, gotcha. Carry on. Nothing else? All right, then. Let me fill in the blanks here. Basically, it's a Trojan horse scenario. Tr uh, astronauts are going to pop across to pick up the Beryllium. Ah, Benalium. <laughs> Uh, but they'll find Cybermen and pick them up instead. And that's their plan. Again, it does seem to me like the first few steps of this plan could have been completely avoided if instead of Cybermat eggs, they'd send across actual goddamn Cybermen. I won't labor the points any further. Back to the wheel. Duggan tells Bones about the Benalium and the Cybermats, and he explains that he didn't tell anyone about the mass because they'd think he was a complete nutso. But why not just show it to them? He didn't have to hide it in a closet full of priceless Benalium and then, you know, run off and tell people. We saw him holding a Cybermat in his hands. He could have just shown it to people and no one would have doubted his sanity. Ugh. What the hell? Next up, he even goes, here, I'll show you so you don't think I'm nuts, Bones. And Bones is like, yeah, all right. You know, see how easy that was, Duggan? You could have done that all along. We get some fantastic overacting as another champ, the same one who got his ears blasted by the nonsense generator in episode one, is red-shirted by the Cybermats. Episode one? Episode two, I think it was, actually. Anyway, yeah, he's red-shirted, but not before he, get, he um, gets some of that quick-set glue and glues one of the Cybermats to the floor, which means there's no visible evidence. It's all cocooned. And guess what? Duggan is now to be sent back to Earth. For what? Because people think he's crazy. How dumb is that? No probs. The mat may be cocooned in plastic, but Zoe, who's been feeding DJ information behind the others' backs, now hands them the plastic cyber mat as well. And together, they're now going to x-ray it to see what's inside. Boom. They do so, they identify it, they figure out there are Cybermen around. Crazy danger. The dynamics between Zoe and Doc and... Uh, Actually, Zoe and Jamie in particular, it's just absolutely marvellous. I am loving it. She's clever, she's challenging the doc, they're butting heads, it's fantastic. And Zoe and Jamie, they're sort of competing for the doc's attention. Very, very good. Plus, I'd like to think that there's a little bit of romantic tension there as well. I would not be surprised if those two end up having some sort of romance subplot on Doctor Who. But we'll see. I may be completely wrong about that. Uh, what is my next note? It is... <laughs> quote... The Hoff is Tanya's love interest. The bone tension is palpable. I'm not sure what that refers to, to be honest. But anyway, yes, that is true. Um, David Hasselhoff and Tanya, they are, like, flirting with each other. Uh, let's speed off to the cliffhanger. I'm spending way too much time on details again. The uh, two astronauts, they're floating across to the rocket where they encounter the Cybermen, who subsequently cyber-hypnotize them into obedience. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say, we got more scenes of Jarvis proving his incompetence as a leader. So yet another disruptively naive leader, quite the trope in Doctor Who, whatever, lovely to have an intact ep regardless. Uh, and one more note before we end this ep, it is fantastic how detailed the credits are. Everyone has a first and surname, even the people who don't have any lines, uh, except for Zoe, who however gets one in dialogue later on, and the token Far Eastern chap, whose name is just Chang. End of episode three, episode four, back to stills again. Jarvis Bennett, that's his full name, has never heard of Cybermen. So when is this serial set, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I looked that up. It's set in 2079. I don't think we find that out in the actual serial. That may come from a novelization or from, an, oh, I don't know, an audiobook? Yeah, possibly the audiobook version. I'm not sure. Anyway, according to Todd's Wikia, it's set in 2079. And that's a little bit crazy. So Jarvis, he should definitely know about the Cybers at this point. The Tenth Planet, for instance, it was set in the distant future of 1986. You know, uh, the moon the moon base was set in 2070, for goodness sake, a mere nine years before this one. Things ought to have been recorded somewhere, surely. And do they not remember that nine years prior, the Earth was under direct threats by Cybermen? Whatevs. Doc provides a great definition of Cybermen here, though. 
Well, what are these Cybermen, then? They were once men, human beings, like yourself in the planet Mondas. But now they're more robot than man. You mean half and half? No, no, more than that. Their entire bodies are mechanical, and their brains have been treated neurosurgically to remove all human emotions, all, all sense of pain. They're ruthless, inhuman killers. Also, on what planet can a grown man who doesn't understand percentages get to run a space station? I guess on no planet. This decision was clearly made after takeoff because the dude in charge of this one is a total nimrod. No Jarvis, not half and half. He said more machine than man. Jarvis is clearly pro-Brexit. Anyway, he doesn't believe them and we see the two hypnotoded astronauts ferrying the cybers across in a box. Wow. Very discreet. Does anyone scan the box? Nope. It might be irradiated. It might carry some disease that disintegrated the silver carrier's crew on a molecular level. They don't know, but no one checks it. Bones tells Doc Hammer that Jarvis shows signs of blocking off his mind. And we cut to Jarvis basically singing his way through the station, going, Good, good. Everything's blended. <laughs> Wherever he goes, he's clearly going bananas. The upside, however, is that his denial has put him in a good mood. And he lets the Doc stretch his legs for a bit while he himself goes to bed. Badass Mo coming up as a dude goes to fetch Banalium rods and we see a 3D animation of him encountering and being killed by a cyber who subsequently dumps him in the waste incinerator. No lie. You have noticed of anyone using the waste incinerator in a loading bay? And just to hammer home how stupid the Cyberman's plan is, the hypnototed astronauts carry Banalium into the wheel and ensure that the laser's being repaired. So, great. Okay, I'm bullet pointing to the cliffhanger now. Blam! Cut to the laser room where Duggan's hard at work and a cyber steps in, apparently having just strolled there unnoticed, and hypnotodes him. Shazam! A so-called Silensky gizmo reveals to the crew that Duggan is hypnoed, and Duggan kills himself rather than be captured. Bing bong! Only a couple of peeps in the room have ever heard of Cybermen, weirdly. But Doc convinces everyone to strap transistors to their necks without giving any spe <laughs> specifics as to, I don't know, voltage? in order to render them resistant to hypnototing, except he himself and Jamie don't sport them, and they still go off hunting for cyber clues. Kablamo! Cut to the storage room where Doc and Jamie are ambushed by a cyber who's apparently returning from a stroll around the wheel, and they are not wearing transistors. End of episode 4, episode 5. DJ hide behind a box, cyber leaves with an alien, crisis averted. They seal all of the airlocks, because cybers might tamper with oxygen supply, they realize, and <laughs> yeah, let's put a pin in that for later as well. Uh, some cybermats arrive, and Doc skypes the control room to play a variable audio frequency over the speakers, which kills all the cybermats, so that's cool. Now we know that that works. Would it work on Cybermen as well? Could they just play it over the station-wide tannoy and end the serial? I'm not sure. Cut to Flanagan, a corpulent Irish badass extraordinaire who fights the two astronauts from before, gets one of them laser-blasted to shit, but is then promptly hypnoed by a Cyberman himself. Some of the very violent, kick-ass scenes survived here. Uh, <laughs> very violent. Clearly the bits that were cut out. Sorry, I'm really speeding through this episode now. Uh, blam! The Hoff uses the laser onto meteorites and it works like a charm. Shazam! Remember the nonsense generator? Oh, you mean the gold rod thing? That's the one. Well, turns out Jamie lost it, possibly aboard the rocket, so now Zoe and he are heading over there, much to the chagrin of the Hoff, who chastises Doc Hammer for letting them go there while looking very dashing. Meteorites are incoming now as well, so let's have some cliffhangers, shall we? One! <laughs> I'm gonna go with numbers this time. One! A Cyberman orders Valance, uh, one of the hypno-astronauts that is, to poison the air supply, turning it into pure ozone that will kill all humans, or indeed anything that isn't an inorganic ent entity that hatched from metal egg. Two! Gemma, that's bones to you and me, overhears this and warns Doc over Skype, but is laser blasted to death, which is pretty intense. Here is a strong female character who's been a major player in the serial so far, and she gets made 100% dead. The Skype webcam even automatically pans down to show her lifeless body on the floor. It is grim. Three, Zoe and Jamie are floating across to the rocket when the l laser dudes, Hoff et al, are overwhelmed by the meteorites and a bunch of meteors zoom straight for the two young companions. Oh, holy smokes, will they make it? End of episode one. Oh, end of episode five. Episode 6. The final episode, and another intact one. I've already mentioned that so many times in this recording. Uh, yeah, look it up on Daily Motion. Lasers are hitting meteorites all over the place. Also, the radiation levels are apparently bananas. So Jamie and Zoe, henceforth collectively referred to as Jay-Z, <laughs> nailed it. Uh, they are in serious trouble. 
Doc explains that it was a calculated risk, though, that it would be worth sacrificing them to save everyone else. So he must be referring to the radiation, killing them shortly after they returned, I take it, right? Because if they die en route, hit by a laser or a meteorite or whatever, he'll never get the nonsense generator, which he now apparently requires in order to save everyone's lives. Yep, that's right. We'll get to it. But he didn't tell Jamie, as far as I'm aware, so that's pretty mean, isn't it? Jamie's taught some lot's sterile. Meanwhile... Jarvis, having learned that Bones is dead so, goes completely nuts and heads off to Jason Statham the Cybers, but has instead killed himself. Cybermen try to release the poison, but it doesn't work because of the airlocks that I mentioned earlier, and the Cyber Planner assumes someone must have experience of their methods, which is nonsense, because Bones fucking saw them. They killed her for it. They killed her while she was on the radio telling everyone about the poison, so clearly that's the experience of their methods that they should assume responsible for their failure, right? Ugh. Really, really weird. This cyber planner does not seem to be as good as the cyber controller in terms of, you know, deducing these things. The cyber planner, by the way, uh, I haven't described the cyber planner. The cyber planner looks like, I guess, reminiscent of, of the Cyberman in that he has that... He's basically wearing headphones, but uh, instead of the Cyberman head or anything like it, like the Cyber Controller looked like a Cyberman except the brain part was outside, like you could see the brain, the actual organic brain. In this case, the Cyber Planner looks 100% electronic. He's basically a light bulb with headphones, pretty much. There's a picture of him on whobackone.com, or rather there will be when I'm done recording this. Okay. So, Jay-Z are safe aboard the rocket, where Zoe somehow inadvertently hacks into the cyber frequency, which apparently is broadcasting openly. And they see a hypnotized astronaut telepathically showing the planner faces and names of people aboard the, the wheel. While the planner goes, you know, nope, can't be that one, nope, nor that one. <laughs> and this is where we get Zoe's full name. She turns up as Zoe Harriet's, or that it shouldn't show up in the end credits. Let's just glaze over how a human being is able to transmit names and faces across Skype, by the way, using only his brain, or how the cyber planner deduces the human involvement and experience based purely on those minor details. More interestingly, though, the doctor is mentioned in that context as well, and the planner doesn't recognize him. What? In Moonbase, cybers even recognized him from the 10th planet, right? But now, nine years later, they've forgotten about him. No matter. A couple of minutes later, the, the planner does recognize him, which again, what? So Jay-Z head back. Not a bene, no mention of the nonsense generator so far. Cut to the dock, Shawshanking through a conveniently launched pipe to the laser room, which in turn is conveniently empty. So let's go back to that pin I dropped earlier. They closed off all the airlocks. So how can Doc climb through the ducts into this room? And why don't the baddies do the same but in reverse? Seems very odd. Doc pockets some mercury, bingo and uh, then starts tinkering with a machine that we'll see more of in a little bit, yada yada. Uh, Jay-Z encounter Flanagan, who takes them back to the control room and is soon taken down and transisted by the Hoff. No problem there, Flanagan's back to normal again. Uh, sorry, speeding through this again. And then they Skype with the Doc, and one, reveal that they did find the nonsense generator on the Silver Surfer. What? And two, Doc hangs up when he notices two Cybers in the room with him. Tense shiznit. We get some James Bond villain explanation fun times from the cybers as they tell him this is just a first step in their invasion of the earth and now they're going to kill him but no dice home slice says doc hammer who it turns out has built a force field in the room that murder death kills one of the cybers and the other one just shits off and just then flanagan and jamie aka irish and scottish <laughs> pop in boom Guess what's on arrival now? Yep, you're right. It's a goddamn cyber ship. Hilariously, Cybermen are exiting the ship now. <laughs> and they're making their way to the wheel. How, you might ask? By literally strolling through space. No thrusters, no jets, <laughs> no, like, rope. <laughs> Just one foot in front of the other, walking through space. <laughs> It's great. A really, really good clip. Uh, you can probably YouTube just that clip somewhere. It's very, very good. Anyway, Irish and Scottish head off to kick some silver ass, which they do, but before they've fully killed a cyber, he opens the hangar doors of the wheel, and now we see the cybers strolling towards them. Wow, terrible. No probs, though. Irish and Scottish press a conveniently located force field button, which just fires the, them off into space. Problem solved. And Doc now pops the nonsense generator into the laser gizmo to boost it, because apparently it does that too. And in the words of Lego Batman, per stry, because one shot is enough to blow the cyber ship to smithereens. All is once again good in the hood. The good guys have won. The Hoff now calls in a report to Earth Central because now the comms are working again. And oh, did I say that, by the way? They took down the comms. Now they're working again. 
and we zoom in on his hand resting on Tanya's because as soon as the credits start rolling, he is taking her to Plowtown. Obvi. Nearly done now. Zoe wants to know more about where DJ are from, and we're treated to something we haven't heard since Vicky was part of the crew, namely, an incorrect TARDIS definition. TARDIS? Oh yes. I asked the Doctor what it meant. Time and relative dimensions in space, he said. Uh, yes. Dimension. Singular. Jesus. Anyway, she sneaks aboard the now re mercury TARDIS, uh, and, uh... <laughs> Let's revisit that very first pin, by the way. Remember Darwin, the fat robot? He glued the TARDIS shut? Well, no biggie, because the writer Totes forgot to bring that plot point back up. And by the way, wait, how did Doc and Jamie get onto the rocket ship? Did they <laughs> steal, <laughs> like, spacesuits and go there? Like, I have no idea. How did Zoe get on board? Oh, did they bring the TARDIS on board the, the wheel? I don't know. Uh, as far as I remember, it is not explained at all. Doesn't matter. Uh, DJ clearly finds Zoe hiding in a box, and before taking her with him, Doc just wants to make sure she's up for the task, so he shows her the Daleks through another sort of mental telepathy computer interface gizmo, except he has to wear a thingy on his head to be technical. Except what he does is, in fact, show her some footage of... I can't remember his name now, what's-his-face, being killed by a Dalek in Evil of the Daleks, as in actual episode footage from Evil of the Daleks, which is kind of odd if you ask me. That's all right, I can live with it. Guess we have a Dalek ep coming up soon. Not next time, though, as far as I'm aware. End of the wheel in space, and end of season five of Classic Who. Review. Review. Okie dokie, uh, as I want to keep this relatively short, I'm going to... I'm going to run through a few bullet points. I've, I've only written up some bullet points for pros and some for cons. I'm just going to rattle through them, basically. Um, I'll start with the pros. The Cybermen. Uh, <laughs> I love them. So creepy and... Uh, oh, they're just... they're fantastic. However, spoilers, they'll come up in the con list as well. The Cybermen are always good because they have that very creepy element of body horror. Are they man? Are they machine? Well, I guess they're more machine than man, Doc just told us, but they are fantastic. I can't remember if they look the same. Yes, I do think so. I think they, these are um, the same generation, so to speak, of Cybermen as we saw in the Moon Base, as opposed to the Tenth Planet, where they just showed up with socks or stockings on their on their heads. Uh, in this case, they have the actual metal head. Very, very creepy. Though, obviously, not as creepy as the, yeah, the stockings. Uh, doesn't matter. I'll move on to the next bullet points. Another pro, Cybermats. This is a very minor pro, but at least they served a purpose in this one. I like that they were menacing in their own right. More than I appreciated them eating banalium. That was just dumb. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, they can actually kill people. Very, very cool. Next up, great ensemble cast. Yes, that is very true. Also, very strong female characters. We have Zoe, we have Tanya, we have Gemma. That's bones to you and me. Very good stuff. Well done, BBC. Genuine progress. And then also the dynamic between Doc and Zoe. And also, as I said before, in particular between Jamie and Zoe. Phenomenal stuff. Cannot wait to see more of them. The last time I felt this way was when I saw Ben and Polly join uh, the Doctor on his adventures. They also had fantastic, a fantastic dynamic. Troughton, obviously, great, except he's absent for a chunk of it. I mentioned I thought he went to the Maldives. Very, very possibly he was on holiday. That's when he was um, out with a concussion. Uh, but when he was on screen, he was very good. You know, he's very inventive. He's clever. Interestingly, I was expecting him to just wield his sonic screwdriver all the time now, since it was introduced in the last serial, the uh, Fury from the Deep. Spoilers for Fury from the Deep, by the way. But it doesn't show up here at all. And I like that he manages to use and invest his genius to solve problems without a sonic screwdriver, something that very rarely happens on Doctor Who in, well, in New who nowadays. All right, let's move on to the cons. Number one, we're back to Cybermen again. This is a this is a two part of me in terms of how big a con they are. Uh, first off, their plan is utter garbage. How many unnecessary steps could they have avoided? Yada yada yada. I've already talked about that ad nauseum. Um, and secondly, much of what creeps me out about them is is that they are humanoids that have really got onto the whole body horror bandwagon, and that they they don't care if others aren't fans. They'll happily turn them into cyber freaks against their will too. But here, there is no mention of that. There's some brainwashing, sure, but it's so easily reversed that I'm not freaked out by it. And also, are they oviparous? Oviparous? How do you pronounce that? Do they lay eggs? Is my points. Do Cybermen lay eggs? I suppose, I mean, it's a very cool concept, but if you're going to use that concept, just use it more wisely. I didn't really think it worked in this one. Next up, Darwin. 
What was the story there? Where did he come from? Was he a man-made robot that sold out the human crew because he sided with his fellow robots? Uh, also, I don't know, had I, had I not known that this was a Cyberman episode, I would have totally assumed that this was the villain of the piece. Like a, you know, a renegade robot that would have been awesome. And truthfully, I really liked Darwin. Uh, the design, the just the idea of him. So he just feels like a wasted resource to me. Either way, even if he is to be wasted, I want to know... I want to know his background. I want to know his origins, basically. Uh, what else? Just little things, really. Like the myriad mentions of psychology and parapsychology out of context. Weird inconsistencies, like what does the time vector generator actually do? Because it seems like it, it seems like it can do everything. It was then, basically, what the sonic screwdriver is today. And that bugs me a little bit. I don't like these Deus Ex Machina machines. Okay, I'm going to round this one off now. Overall, the pros do win. Uh, and I'm going to give the wheel in space a 3.5. Right, Rooney and Cheesecakes, we have received a... how many? Oh my god, we've received three Listener Minis for this one. Before I jump into Listener Mini Land, though, I'm going to say something pretty cool and very related. I I'm looking at the WordPress app right now, which lists the stats regarding comments, aka Listener Minis, on whoback1.com. And I've got a top list. I didn't realize I had a top list on this thing. Check this out. Here are the... Top 7 Most Contributing Listener Mini Writers, a.k.a. Listeners. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start at number 7 with Trenton Bless, who has contributed 16, no less than 16 comments or Listener Minis. This is listing comments, I will say that. I think, I think every one of his comments is a Listener Mini. That's pretty awesome. Trenton, well done. Next up, we have Kyle Rath with 17. Kyle, where have you been? I haven't heard from you in ages. You need to send in some more minis, buddy. Then, with 18, we have pre Who Back When co-host Marius Kane. That's Kane with a K. That's JD. Then, with 19, Gina G, Gina Guerrero herself. And then, we're jumping huge, huge distances to Gallifreyan Buccaneer. Gallifreyan Buccaneer. Who has sent in no less than 26. Holy smokes. Then, with 27, is Steven. Steven, 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 Steven. But at number one, and this is, uh, I am really impressed. Someone who sent in, I don't even know how many listener minis he sent in at once. <laughs> he basically just sent in a listener mini for every single classic ever. With 44, we have Peter Zunich. Peter Zed, the Zedmeister. Uh, congratulations, Peter. You, <laughs> you are number one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you should take this as a challenge. Do you want to challenge these top seven contributors? Well, of course you do. So send in your listener minis. Are you one of these seven, but not number one? Well, there's only one way to climb those ranks. Keep sending in those listener minis. Awesome stuff. Anyway. <laughs> I just discovered that stat and I'm really, really excited. Okay, I'm going to jump into this. Uh, in chronological order, the first listener mini we received for The Wheel in Space comes from Trenton Bless. That's Bless with two S's. Uh, as per usual, Trenton has sent in a massive, massive maxi review. So I'm just going to pick out two paragraphs from this one. But you can read the, you can read his maxi review in its full cosmic splendor on whobackwhen.com. Trenton says, At the end of season five, fresh ideas and money fall short, and we witness an uneasy alliance between scientist Kit Peddler and fabulist David Whittaker. Peddler developed the wheel-shaped space station and technical astronomical ideas, but these alone couldn't sustain six episodes. It was down to Whittaker to flesh out some drama albeit with a clunkily tortuous plot. And he concludes, Of all the Cybermen serials of the 60s, this is maybe my least favorite. The Cybermen look cool. Too bad this is the only appearance of these costumes in the series. And Wendy is fantastic as Zoe. And let's not forget Pat's little line fluff in episode 6. <laughs> In brackets, he said sexual air supply instead of sectional air supply. <laughs> soundbite that if you haven't already. God damn it! <laughs> Where is the soundbite? <laughs> Sorry I haven't soundbite that. That is amazing. Okay, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna watch that episode one more time. Uh, he goes on. So, what do I give this serial? Well, I give it a 2.63 out of 5. This serial just didn't have enough money going into it, making it look a little cheap. And the serial did lack in places, but the positives I listed above give it stability, so I feel this is a fair rating. Well, 
If you feel it's a fair rating, buddy, then it's a fair rating. Well done, man. Your Waxy review is awesome. It is a, <laughs> it is a fantastic conglomerate of trivia and analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to, you have to read it on whobackwhen.com. Thank you so much for sending that intro. And uh, super duper quick note, you are absolutely right. Uh, in my synopsis slash review, I said that the... Oh, was it my... Yeah, it was it my review, I think. I said that the uh, the Cybermen look exactly as they did in the last Cyberman serial. You're absolutely right, though. They don't. Because, and I had to look this up, I didn't realize this on my own, this is the first time that they have the teardrop thing on their face as well. So, super good observation. Well done, man. Thank you for sending in your maxi review. Ladies and gentlemen... If you want to follow Trent and Bless on Twitter and high-five him, tell him hi from me. You can find him. He is at Trent and Bless. That's Bless with two S's. Next up, in chronological order, we have the Zed Meister himself, Peter Zed, Peter Zunich. And because you are numero uno on the, <laughs> on the listener mini rider ranking list, um, Pete Meister, I'm going to read yours out in full. Here we go. It's a mini. He says... This is the second Classic Who episode in a row that I have never watched or telesnapped. Unfortunately for me, it is undoubtedly the last new Classic TV Who for me as well. I've been watching in order until now, and I know I've seen everything after this at least once. My only hope now is that some more missing footage will be recovered. God, I hope so as well, man. He goes on. This makes me somewhat sad. The episode was a little plodding and simple, but in general, it worked okay and held my interest at a constant level. The production design was exceptional this time, from the autopilot robot to doorways on the ship to the lava lamp infested environmental <laughs> control room. Yeah, good, good point. I didn't, I didn't comment on that. There was much thought put into the props and sets. The one exception to this was, ironically, the Cybermen themselves, who seemed more jumpsuity than hybrid mechanizy this time. What was there was nice, but overall it was less to look at, and that's part of the reason they were far less intimidating this time around. There are two notable additions to Doctor Who lore in this story. The first is obviously Zoe, who, like Jamie, will have a very long and welcomed run on the show. Zoe is the exact antithesis of Victoria. And in this episode, we even see Jamie taking on his old role of not knowing what things are because he's from the past. Zoe has no experience, however, and that will often leave her in the dark as much as anyone. The second edition is that of the Cyber Controller. Although it is never referred to as such here, this element will be reused on and off for decades to come, making the Cybermen a completely unified and powerful fighting force. In this episode, however, it thinks too much for them and makes them a little dumb, seemingly unable to make decisions on their own without calling home to Mama. <laughs> uh, Quick notes before I uh, round off uh, your mini, Zed Meister. According to TARDIS Wikia, this is not the Cyber Controller, and we have encountered the Cyber Controller before. He was in uh, the, oh, what's it called? Tomb of the Cybermen, we had the Cyber Controller. Possibly in a prior one as well? No, I don't think so. I, we definitely had him in Tomb of the Cybermen. However, uh, according to TARDIS Wikia, he is instead the Cyber Planner in this one, which is why he looks very, very different. Anyway, rewind to understand what I'm trying to fumbly, clumsily tell you here. Okie dokie. The Zed Meister goes on. As mentioned already, the story takes a long time to get going. Four and a half episodes, in fact, and things don't really start happening until late in episode five. I'm also not sure why such an elaborate ruse was needed. <laughs> yeah, you and me both, buddy. Surely if the Cybermen pulled up in a spaceship and turned the distress beacon on, the wheel would have undoubtedly sent a search party over, and we could have been spared three episodes. <laughs> yes, very true. And what was the reason for the attack in the first place? Something about half their ships not being able to find Earth? Um, isn't it just to the left of where your own home planet blew up? <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. That's more than a little silly, and thus earns the Retro Rewrite of the Week Award. The base being used as a transfer point for goods going back to Earth would have been a much better reason, not to mention their ability to monitor almost all Earth communication. The recon I watched did a wonderful job of animating Cybermen and the autopilot alike. There was a lot of work put into it, and it really helped with so much of the missing footage. This week's most missed footage thus goes to the fire in the TARDIS at the beginning of episode one. This brings me back to my original point. While interesting, the story wasn't very exciting and thus earns a 2.7 out of five. Awesome, Mini. Thank you very much for sending that in, Pete Meister. <laughs> I'm happy to see that someone, you know, disagrees with me about the, the Cybermen. I think they look absolutely splendido, totes belotes badass in this one. I really, really like them. But yeah, okay, all good points. <laughs> and I'm 100% on board with your retro rewrites. Thank you very much for sending that in. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to 
tip your hat to uh, <laughs> the Zed Meister on Twitter, well, sucks to be you because he hasn't left a Twitter handle. You can reply to his mini on whobackwhen.com though. Yeah. See? See what I'm doing here? I'm trying to ferry people to the website. Okay, thanks again, dude. On with the show. Next up, we have... Oh, man. Guess who sent this one in? Yeah, that's right. This one comes from Steven. Steven, 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 Steven. S Gamer Ready to himself with... Oh, well done, man. You kept it to 250. Well done. All right. Here is Steven's mini review. He goes, The wheel in space introduces us to Zoe, my favorite of Troughton's female companions, and one of my favorite classic companions in general. One thing I realized only recently that ups my opinion of her is that Zoe is with the possible exception of Susan, the first companion to join the TARDIS entirely of her own volition. She wasn't kidnapped, taken by accident, or invited because she had nowhere else to go. She realized she was missing out on something awesome, wanted in, and stowed away by herself. Yes, good point. He goes on, This serial also introduces us to John Smith, the pseudonym the Doctor would carry into the modern era as recently as the human nature slash family of blood two-parter this review will likely be sandwiched between. Yes, you're right about that too. The serial had some good side characters with Gemma and Jar Jarvis giving us both ends of the commanding officer's spectrum of trusting ally and belligerent obstacle. I also liked the flirtatious two officers that were our Greek chorus. Oh yeah, that is Tanya and David Hasselhoff. Oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Alright, he goes on. My only actual issue is I'm not entirely certain what the Cyberman's plot actually was. <laughs> I think it was control the wheel so their ship had easy passage or have it aid them? Still, it's not the first nor last time a Doctor Who plot was incomprehensible, so it's not a serious markdown since it was entertaining otherwise. I give... Wheel in Space, a 3.9. Awesome. Fantastic rating. He adds uh, sort of a PS. He goes, one last question. Is this the first time the Cybermen have been associated with Silver, having arrived via the Silver Carrier? Yes, dude. I made this observation as well. Tots my lords. It absolutely is the first one. Nice one. And also, can I just say, dude, you have a huge heart. <laughs> and it's only slightly bigger than mine. Holy crap! 3.9 out of 5? That is amazeballs. Um, Zedmeister gave this 2.7. Trenton gave this 2.63. I mean, those two are very close, but you and I are very close in, in our ratings as well, Stephen. Awesome. Stephen, fantastic. Thank you very much for sending that in. Ladies and gentlemen, you know how to find Stephen. He is on Twitter. Say hi from us. He is at... S Gamer 82 that is 82, the number. Kablamo! Okie dokie, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Tune in next time. Uh, we're going to be reviewing, uh, as S Gamer 82 accurately predicted, we're going to be reviewing the New Who episode, Family of Blood, which concludes the story that started off in Human Nature. Fantastic double feature. Oh, awesome. Wow. I'm so aroused right now. After that, we're going to do a classic again. It will be The Dominators. I've not seen it. I've seen some screenshots and the outfits. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, wanna, I want all of those outfits. They look amazing. Oh, yeah. And at some point, we will get around to recording the next audiobook review, in which case it will be of The Scapegoats. I will say one thing, though. We are probably going to take a... I say probably because if this happens, I don't want you to get pissed off and start tweeting really, really mean things at us. But we will very likely be taking a two-week break at this point. Why, you ask? Well, because uh, i got to go on holiday sometime as well. That's right. So I'm going to go away for about a week. And when I'm back, uh, we're going to sit down and we're going to try to just bulk record a bunch of episodes. So I would say you have about a week to send us the next classic and the next n two new who's. Just so that we have some episodes in the can. Because at the moment, we're sort of hand-to-mouth slash episode to ether. That's it for this week, though. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to say hi to me on Twitter... Please feel free, I will say hi to you right back. Uh, I'm at Ponkin, here's a soundbite of JD singing how you spell that. P-O-N-K-E-N, Ponkin. Thanks, JD. Continue being rad and excellent to each other. Catch you next time. Rock on and cha-chao. Kablamo! Did you enjoy the show? Then please do what the cosmos compels you to and spread the gospel of who back when. Tell your friends. Don't have any friends? No problemo. Tell some strangers. Like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash who back when. All in one word. Are you on Google Plus? Find us on Google Plus. That's plus who back when. And when you do, tell us why you're on Google Plus. 
Hupa Quen just got its very own Twitter account. No lie, so give us a follow. You guessed it, that's at Hupa Quen, all in one word. Check us out on SoundCloud, vote us up on Reddit, listen to us on Stitcher, and head on over to our website, whobackwhen.com, where you can leave a comment, submit a review of your own, and peruse our visual index of aliens, monsters, and more, which increases in Kablamos with every episode. And lastly, give us a rating and review on iTunes. Not only would it make us super chuffed, and it really, really would, but as thanks, we will transmigrate your iTunes nom de plume into the credit list of trailers for fake Doctor Who audiobooks produced by Who Back When. Have a poke around our bonus episodes to make more sense of that. That's it. Rock on and be rad and excellent to each other. Catch your earballs in our next classic Who review, new Who review, or, <laughs> still funny, audio Who review. Cha ciao. Who back when? Hello. <laughs> Bing bong. Shazam and ding dong. <laughs> Hot. Bonus. Catch you on the flip side. Cha ciao.